Water is one of the most important natural resources on our planet. Plants, animals and humans depend on water for their survival. Globally, approximately 60% of all evapotranspiration comes from plants. Thus, plants return 39% of the precipitation to our atmosphere through the process of transpiration, hereby transporting water from the soil through the roots to small pores on the underside of their leaves. The amount of water that is lost is determined by morphological traits of these plant pores, such as their size and number. Plants can also actively regulate these pores by opening and closing them in response to environmental stimuli such as light, atmospheric gases and temperature. Previous research has shown that an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide can decrease the amount of water being lost by plants. A decrease in plant transpiration as a result of higher carbon dioxide concentrations will reduce the amount of water being recycled back into the atmosphere. Soils as a result will become more saturated with water, increasing the risk of runoff and flooding. Jennifer McElwain, a professor at the Earth Institute in University College Dublin, has taken to the challenge to investigate whether future changes in plant behaviour from rising levels of carbon dioxide will globally alter the risk to runoff and flooding. This is a really unique project because it addresses a big gap in our understanding. So, Currently we know that all plants have different behaviour, so they have a different rate at which they can take up carbon dioxide and release water. And we know that all plants have different behaviour across a day, so some plants may have a, a siesta at lunchtime, they stop gas exchange and then they restart it again in the afternoon. And what's unique about this project is we've collected over 300 species from over 22 different sites around the world seven different global biomes and what we're trying to capture is the typical behaviour of the vegetation from those specific sites all around the world and how they respond to different environmental factors. Not only do we have this incredible modern data set from vegetation all around the world, we also have a historical data set which we, was collected by um, another team back in the 80s and 90s when the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was lower than that of today and we've revisited the same geographical locations so we can ask the question how does vegetation respond to increasing carbon dioxide under contemporary climate change and does the vegetation of the earth all behave in the same way in terms of its gas exchange properties or are there distinct differences in different biomes in different parts of the world? And this is significant because if we can understand how vegetation responds to climate change and carbon dioxide, we can then look at um, local risks for flooding and drought and how vegetation processes water through the plant body. So the SFI team is really diverse um, in terms of um, expertise and knowledge. We have plant physiologists, we have plant taxonomists because there's a major challenge going to different parts of the world and trying to identify what plants are present in different biomes. We have climate modellers looking at model data fusion, so taking the data and trying to improve models. We also have plant ecologists because we need to put the data we capture in the field from an individual species into the bigger context of the whole plant community and the biome where it is geographically. In 2013, the research team began to gather modern physiological and morphological plant data from seven globally important biomes. It took the researchers three years to complete their surveys. My name is Upang So. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in the SFI project working on plant vegetation response to climate change. As part of the project, me and my colleague went around the world doing field work in seven world biomes, ranging from tropical 
temperate and boreal regions, collecting ecophysiological data. One of the methods we use to measure plant water loss is using infrared gas analyzer. To measure plant water loss from leaf, we attach this leaf to a sensor on this machine. And this machine basically calculates water loss based on plant physiology principles. The team collected samples from over 260 species from 22 global sites and measured over 1,300 individual leaves. Following the completion of the fieldwork, the scientists returned to Ireland to process the samples. In the field, we are measuring stomatal conductance and we get a feel for how the plants are responding to the atmosphere. We can use historic samples back in the lab to compare 25 year old leaves to the modern equivalent leaves and see the morphological change that have happened in that time. We cut small sections of each leaf and we examine the surface, usually the abaxial surface, using fluorescence microscopy. We then count the number of stomata on historic and modern leaves and we also measure the stomata size, the stomata aperture being the most important part. While we know that over long time periods leaves do adapt, we want to see and we are convinced that over shorter time periods, especially in response to rapidly rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that there will be morphological changes and by examining our historic and our modern leaves together, we will be able to see those changes over time. Out of 1,400 leaves collected in the field, we have taken images of over 1,000 already. We've also measured the stomata and counted the numbers on each of the historic and modern leaf samples. I'm Connor Purcell and I'm a climate modeler here at UCD. And my job here is to work with climate models and utilize the data which has been collected by our colleagues here at UCD as they've gone out through the field and brought back uh, multiple data sets. The models I use require a number of input data for uh, processing, of course. So one of the benefits of this project is that we've uh, acquired a new uh, data set from uh, across the world, incorporating a number of biomes. So we can, in the future, incorporate that data into a model or into, into a number of models, in fact. And through the process of uh, calculation that the model utilizes based on the laws of uh, physics, we can then result in a number of model outputs and these outputs of course are uh, parameters which we don't have data for so they can tell us something we don't know. So the input data, the new input data is very useful for us in that sense. So this project is important globally but it also has importance for Ireland and what we want to do is set up a long-term monitoring or two long-term monitoring sites at the vegetation of Ireland so we can track how their behaviour changes in response to carbon dioxide as it continues to increase in the future. As soon as we have data understanding how the vegetation of Ireland um, is responding to contemporary climate change and how it's responding to increases in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we can then begin to model or better predict how future changes in vegetation will influence water transport through the plant body. So how, and this has implications for flood risk and drought risk and of course understanding water resources and how they're going to change in the future is critically important for all of the industries in Ireland, tourism, fisheries, forestry, agriculture and we're trying to yeah, improve local predictions based on vegetation feedback. This project, not only do we have field data and observational data and modelling work, I think it's also very important to get an experimental understanding and the reason we need to do this is we need to experimentally test the observations we see in the field. So we have this incredible facility in UCD, it's called PAIC, Programme for Experimental Atmospheres and Climates, and in this lab we have controlled environment chambers where we can program in the atmospheric composition and climate of the past, so the 1980s and 1990s, or we can program in the conditions that we expect in the future by the year 2050 and we can grow 
plants which are common in the different biomes we've collected in the field and examine how they change their gas exchange behaviour in response to very subtle changes in carbon dioxide. And this really hasn't been done and this is what we want to do in the future, um, looking forward beyond this project.